Uh, we have Deborah Machak here uh, from UINC. She's a grad student there. As she just mentioned, she's also a graduate fellow at the Illinois Center for Advanced Studies of the Universe. Um, she was originally at University of Houston for her undergrad, uh, where she won the Best Undergraduate Senior Thesis Award as well. Um, she has worked on the beam energy scan theory collaboration and works on the equation of state. Um, and I think I'll let her take it away on uh, QCD critical point search with BES ethic. Yes, thanks so much. Okay, so my talk has two components. Uh, the first one is a lot of getting everyone on the same page about the physics, the physical phenomena that I'm going to be discussing and notation. And the second portion is results. And I think the results I have to present, they all follow from very simple mathematical arguments. So I think as long as we're all on the same page about the basic physics in the beginning, um, everyone should be able to follow the actual results. I know we have a diversity of expertise in here, so I wanted to take some time to discuss the basic phenomenon that I care about before we jump into <clears throat> anything more technical. Um, so the first definition is QCD, which is a theory that describes strong reactions governing behavior of quarks and gluons and hadrons. And I'm sure you're familiar with this depiction of the QCD phase diagram. So what this actually pictures is phase boundaries. So transitions between a hadron gas or a gluon plasma phase. And these are phases that are assumed when you look at it like this to be in thermal and chemical equilibrium. And the other thing I wanted to point out here is that phase transitions are thermodynamic singularities in the phase diagram. So what we're looking at here are different phases. So the physics of these different phases, the relative degrees of freedom, as well as the singularities on the phase diagram. Um, the laser is working. Okay. So for my folks saying high energy has ion collisions, you live. Oh, it was working. It like dims over time. You live along the temperature <laughs> axis. <laughs> um, the beam energy scan, I'm going to go into more detail about this, but the whole idea is that you probe the higher density regime, but still hopefully getting to the particle plasma phase. And then I want to include this additional dimension because another type of system that's really, re really relevant right now is astrophysical systems. So you hear a lot about neutron stars and neutron star mergers. And I just always like to point out that those phenomena actually live on a different portion of the phase diagram. The portion where you have a asymmetry between the number of neutrons and protons in your system. So even heavy ion collisions, uh, if we're talking about um, the ions that we collide, roughly you have a symmetry between the number of protons and neutrons. So your charge fraction is gonna be about a half. So this is a symmetric regime. As you start doping your system with more and more neutrons, you're going to be coming into this axis. So part of the experimental program at EFRIB is to try to produce ions that um, have more of an abundance of neutrons so that we can probe what happens to phase diagram in a different regime, but still, as you move into this isosting asymmetric axis. So the guiding question, one of, one of the guiding questions in nuclear physics right now is, what is the nature of the transition from a hydrogen gas to deconfined quarks and gluons at finite densities? It was a priority in the last long range plan, and it's still a priority in the long range plan that just came out. Before we can actually discuss this question, I feel like we need to unpack it a little bit. And I just want to have a little recap. Probably a lot of this is in a step next course at some point. Um, some of you maybe work with this every day, but just in case you don't, um, a system in thermal and chemical equilibrium can be described by thermodynamic state variables. So those would be uh, your pressure, your temperature, entropy, energy density, chemical potential, number density. And your equation of state is the relationship between these thermodynamic variables. For instance, how the pressure changes with energy density. In a phase transition, the order of a phase transition, you can characterize it by the lowest order derivative of the free energy, which is discontinuous at the transition. So when you hear about a crossover, for instance, in QCD, you can look at susceptibilities with respect to the bearing chemical potential. And if all of those derivatives are continuous, uh, they don't diverge, then you have a crossover transition. But if the nth order derivative diverges, then you have a derivative of order n. 
In case of you, what we expect to see from experiments is that you have, I'm gonna use my pointer. Um, because we know that we have a crossover transition here, and I'll explain why, and we have predictions for first order phase transition um, at higher densities, there must be a critical endpoint that is a second order phase transition, which the limits the end of this first order phase transition regime and the beginning of this crossover transition regime. Okay, so that's the basics of a critical point. So at this point, you have a second order divergence in the susceptibility. Well, a divergence in the second order susceptibility. Our main theoretical tool for, tool for studying PCD from first principles is lattice. So in lattice QCD, you have this approximation that we achieve by discretizing the action. And you have these lattice sites, and then you place your quarks um, in the sites, and then the gluons are the connection between different quarks. And you do an important sampling of all possible configurations that you can have on this lattice in a certain volume. And the problem with finite density is that if you try to insert some kind of bearing on charge as a background, so finite chemical potentials, uh, the exponential of the action that informs your important sampling becomes complex. So you can no longer interpret that as a probability. So that is known as the sign problem. However, you can get information about lattice at finite densities by just performing a Taylor expansion. So you would compute the coefficients of the Taylor expansion at mu equals zero, and then expand to get the pressure or different thermodynamic quantities at a finite chemical potential. So we do have access um, to these susceptibilities from the lattice. So if you're looking at the pressure, the coefficients of the Taylor expansion are gonna be susceptibilities that I was just talking about up to order six and there are estimates for order eight. Um, and we know that the transition at mu equals zero is a smooth crossover. We also know from this regime here that we can Taylor expand that the transition line is has a small negative curvature. So that's why when you see the phase diagram depicted, you will normally see this parabolic curve. I think here the scale is weird, so it's more pronounced, but normally it will be a, a curve that has a very small negative curvature. On the other hand, like I was saying, many theoretical models, and this is quite an old illustration, but it just shows a prediction from a variety of models with quarks um, of where this critical point would be on the phase diagram. And you can see that they don't really agree on a location. <coughs> so experiment is really key in this regime for us to understand um, the phase diagram. Because clearly we don't have a good theoretical grasp and we don't have access to first principle calculations. So in the beam to energy scan program, the idea is that you would vary collision energy to probe different regimes of the phase diagram. <clears throat> and one of the main goals is, of course, to find this QCD critical point. Um, I'm just going to go quickly through this figure because it's going to inform a slide that's coming up. Uh, for the anatomy of a collision, normally what we talk about is you have some initial state. For very high energy collisions, that's just going to be some energy density plane because the nuclei are going so fast to just pass through each other and you're left with this, this field of energy. Um, then from there you form a core cool plasma phase, which expands and cools. And this is typically at your hydrodynamic stage. And then you have cavernization and you can evolve your hadrons as well. And at some point you have kinetic freeze out and then the particles hit your detector. So this is, very well defined, I would say, for high energy collisions. But the picture at intermediate and low energies is a little bit different. So I have listed here some of the challenges that we have to worry about as we start probing lower and lower collision energies. So the first thing is that as you lower the, the energy in your initial state, aside from having bare in the position, um, your states are not, your nuclei are not going to be contracted anymore. So you actually need to have a three dimensional initial state, whereas in very high energy collisions, you can get away with a two dimensional plane. Um, then the transition, when you're in this regime, the transition from this initial state to hydro is 
very fuzzy. We don't know what a good description for that would be, probably because you would have a mixture of systems, systems that behave hydrodynamically and subsystem that doesn't. Um, also, you have to worry about fluctuations of QCD charges in these initial state in this three-dimensional plane. So namely variance changes in electric charges, as well as quarks that might be in a QD unit. In your hydrodynamical evolution, you then have to worry about propagating these QCD currents, these VSQ charges. Um, if you're close to the critical point, you have to worry about critical fluctuations and correlations and how to propagate those. There's a big question about whether the mode coming from the critical point singularity would be slowed down in the hydrodynamic evolution, which is called critical slowing down. And if you're in your first order phase transition, you might have different phases coexisting. So you have different domains. Then in particleization of hydronic phase, if there were any fluctuations and correlations from those pre um, hydronization stages, you have to preserve those. And we don't understand how to do that yet. Um, and then in your kinetic evolution, that's still going to be sensitive to an equation of state if you're doing something like a mean field approach. Um, and that has to reflect the presence of first order phase transition or a critical point. Um, and lastly, the equation of state, this is an entire field of research by itself in, in this topic, is that you need something that has a finite, large chemical potential in its regime of applicability and a critical point. Um, you also have to worry about strains and electric charge dependence. And then you have results from lattice QCD, which you should match in the regime that they apply. And then this other figure here, I'm just showing because it could be that as you lower the energy uh, in your collisions, you stop producing the QCD and you're fully in a hydronic phase. So you can have even entirely different classes of modeling um, just for the beam energy scan. Please interrupt me if you have questions. Okay. <laughs> My least favorite thing is talking to myself. <laughs> so in terms of a critical point, there's a very nice property um, of universality. So there's a scaling postulate that is um, one of the guiding principles of the theory of critical phenomena that all singular contributions to thermodynamic quantities uh, by singular means something like a divergent, divergence are powers of this correlation lane. And at a critical point, the correlation in your system diverges. So when you're near a critical point, you actually have universal quantities called critical exponents, which dictate how the scaling of the different thermodynamic observables um, happens as powers of the correlation. <clears throat> um, you might have seen this picture before. This is a nice illustration of the divergence of the correlation lane. Um, as you approach the critical point from the crossover regime, you know, the correlation will start to diverge and your density fluctuations become so large that a medium which was previously transparent now becomes opaque because the scattering is just all over the place. Um, and the nice thing about universality is that you don't need to know the details about the interactions in your system. So this goes with um, the degrees of freedom in the theory and their symmetry. So for QCD, um, we know the symmetries. We know that it's a three-dimensional theory in space, um, which means that QCD falls in the 3D Ising universality class. So you, if you took a graduate course in Stepnik, you've definitely seen this. This is just a pair magnet. And what the phase diagram for that looks like is you have a crossover regime. So this is centered at around the, the critical temperature in this reduced magnetic field. Um, so our variables here are T and H. You have a crossover regime and then a first order transition where your magnetization flips sign with the magnetic field. On one side, you have a paramagnet, and the other side, you have a paramagnet. So there is a very famous result. Um, which you might have seen this plot before. I'm pretty sure you have. It's a very famous result um, if you're working anywhere near the beam energy scan. Um, basically, the argument here is that higher order susceptibility, so the zeros of the pressure, will diverge with higher powers of the correlation. We can calculate this and confirm uh, that that is the case. And the fourth order susceptibility, which is something that we 
think we have a good experimental proxy for diverges with the seventh power of the correlation line. So it's a good signal to noise ratio exponentially. And our experimental proxy for that would be the kurtosis of the net proton distribution. Um, so then you can turn to your universal behavior and ask yourself what is happening in the theory. So for QCD, it would be going to the 3D Ising model and calculating the equivalent quantity in Ising variables, and then making a qualitative prediction for what we would see in experiments. The key assumption here that was made in this, this um, famous result by Stefanov is that the leading contribution to the chemical potential, susceptibilities of the chemical potential, is coming from the magnetic field in the Ising variables. And when you do that, there's a parametrization for the 3D Ising model. You can't quite solve it analytically, but you can parametrize it, get the thermodynamics, and then map it back um, to Ising variables. The prediction that came out of that is that there is a change in the sign of the kurtosis as you approach the critical point from a crossover side. So here we're looking at the phase diagram um, of the kurtosis uh, density plot in Ising variables. So this would be our critical point here on the crossover side, here on the first order phase transition side, and there is this negative lobe in the kurtosis. So if you think now that in experiments, what you're probing is different values of density or different values um, along this freeze that line, very generously calling freeze that line, um, what you would expect to see as you lower your beam energies is a dip in this quantity followed by <laughs> this very positive region here. So with Dip followed by a peak. In fact, that the K4 has a finite value of the, maybe if the correlation link would really go to infinity, also the K4 would go to infinity there. At the critical point, it does. So this line, so this plot here is along the spring line. So you can see it's not quite a critical um, point. So because of finite side effects, uh, the correlation can, of course, not complete diverge. Yes, yes. And not bigger than the this is our ideal world, but yes, and if so, you have to worry about that. So, so no, no, also in theory, if you want to compare to it. Yes. Uh, how would finite size, would finite size change that thought? Um, so to get rid of volume effects, you take ratios of these cumulants. So you would look at chi 4 over chi 2 and that should cancel but, the volume. But no, no, you're no, asking no, about no, the divergence. I, I ask about diversion because uh, the correlation cannot really that it cannot become yeah, yeah. bigger than the system size. Yes. It's all the same as the finite volume effect, which is linear in any volume. That yeah, would no, it wouldn't truly really diverge. That would be cut off in the maximum size. And would that change that picture quantity of your quality of your law? No, no. You would still have a negative lobe and a positive lobe. It would change the height of the, the peak. So it would change the height, that's what I have. Yeah. Um, but I think I'm, we'll see later how quickly this peak disappears depends on assumptions that you make about the scaling. Um, but yeah, in terms of the divergence of these quantities and limitations into finite volume, yes, you would be capped by the same of size, so you wouldn't really diverge. <clears throat> okay. So finally, some experimental products. <laughs> um, <laughs> So what I'm showing here at the top is just the raw net proton distributions. I'm pretty sure there are some corrections that have to be made before you can compute the net proton kurtosis. Um, but basically, at all these different beam energies, you would look at the moments of the distribution. And then what you're seeing on the right is um, the fourth order cumulant multiplied by the variance, uh, which is the proxy for that fourth order variance susceptibility that I've been talking about. And from the first run of the beam energy scan, what was seen um, is a very exciting hint of this non-monotonic trend um, at a 3.1 sigma level. So this got people really excited because we just talked about this specific prediction for a non-monotonic trend. Um, and it seems, although the error bars are really large, that there is a divergence afterwards, and then at very low beam energies, you actually um, you can describe the points with a fully hydronic system. So at that point, you probably turned off the production. 
So the critical points, if present in accessible and collisions, <clears throat> is expected to be somewhere in this um, beam energy range. Okay, so now we're getting to the second part of the talk where I'm going to make those mathematical arguments that I was talking about. So is everything okay so far? Okay. So the key assumption in that original result that got very famous is that you had only that leading order contribution to the susceptibilities. What I'm going to do now is relax that assumption and write a more generic map for how your universal behavior from the 3D Eisen model would map onto the Q2D phase diagram. So this generic map, of course, is a choice. If we knew the answer, then we would know the critical behavior. <laughs> So we come up with a parametrization, a parametrized map. So there are three parameters here. And we make an educated guess. So this is a, a linear map. It's a simple choice, but it's one that gives you enough flexibility in terms of what your critical region can look like. Um, so recall that our Eisen variables were the reduced temperature and reduced magnetic field, and our humidity variables are T and UV. So in this map, um, these two parameters, T critical and UV critical, control the position of your phase diagram. So if you think about copying and pasting that I do phase diagram onto the QCD phase diagram plane, this would be the position of the center of that phase diagram. Then you have two scaling parameters, W, which appears in front of both R and H, so that's a global scaling variable. It controls the overall size of the region. And then you have rho, which is a relative scaling variable, which stretches the r direction. Um, yes, the r direction along the phase transition line. And then you have two angular parameters, alpha one and alpha two. So alpha one is how much you rotate the Ising axes with respect to lines of constant temperature. So this would be quite literally just rotating the, the phase diagram. And alpha two. Um, is a really important parameter. It determines the mixing between R and H axes, so their angle with respect to each other. So it could be orthogonal, where they're not mixed at all. Um, but if they're not orthogonal, there's going to be some mixing between these two variables as you map them into T and UV. So in this regime, you can recall, I hinted that we have some lattice results. Uh, the first one being that shape of the parabola that determines the transition. Um, so if you know the temperature at which your crossover is defined, there's some nuance to that definition, but this T naught is kind of a crossover temperature. So this is going to be a point here. And if you know how it should behave um, with mu B, then if you have a mu B C that you picked, that would also fix your critical temperature. Uh, so that just tells you that your critical point temperature cannot be too low compared to your crossover temperature on the t-axis. And then by virtue of the shape of the transition line being a parabola, you would also fix this alpha one because it's a linear map. So at the critical point, um, this origin is going to be tangential to your critical point in the physical phase diagram. So this map allows us to calculate this chi four that I've been talking about, its dependence on the size and the shape of the critical region in terms of T and UV, instead of just talking about Ising variables. So now if we, yes. Uh, so can you explain again, what's the difference between T naught and TC? So T naught um, defines a sort of crossover temperature on the UV equals zero axis. Um, so this in lattice uh, calculations would be the inflection point of the chiral quantum state. It just kind of determines roughly the center of that crossover region on the phase diagram. You want to PC or UV equals zero. Oh, so okay. Yes, yes. Um, I use C to denote specifically critical point, but yes, yeah. Um, and then TC is your critical point position. So this is a singular. Point. You have a line of temperatures in, at which the transition happens, but the second order point, that's TC. Okay. Good. Okay. So with 
this mapping can take into account all the terms. Um, and so taking the derivative in UB actually corresponds to some mixing between taking a derivative in the H direction and the R direction. So if you recall the previous approximation only took into account the contribution from this H direction. And you can see here that the sine alpha one term goes in the front of this contribution from the H direction, which was previously the leading contribution. But I just told you that alpha one is small. Alpha two is unconstrained in this map. We don't have any symmetry theory arguments that we can make to constrain alpha two. So it could be that alpha two is much bigger than alpha one. Um, in fact, the contribution um, from this H direction is only the leading order contribution. It's only the leading contribution when alpha, alpha two is of the same magnitude or smaller than alpha one, which is, oh, I didn't put a value here. Oh, here I did. Um, two to five. So if you think about all the options you have, um, this is a very limited regime. So now that we've come up with this general mapping, the previous universal prediction is a special case, and you actually have a range of different behavior that you can observe in terms of the kurtosis. And this is all related to different sizes, shapes, and location of the critical region. Um, so here is the equivalent plot just flipped um, in the horizontal direction. So now this is coming from the crossover side, decreasing collision energy. And you see here for different values of this alpha two, that only when it is small, you run into this dip before you run into the peak. And this is assuming that your system is freezing out one MeV away from the critical point. So where you freeze out also plays a huge role because for some of these critical points, the signal disappears really fast. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more later. Just hint me at that now. Um, this is of course only talking about the critical contribution. We also have to worry about lattice PCD. And if we're still compatible with lattice PCD when we introduce this critical um, component to our equation of state. <clears throat> so this is one of those things that to me makes perfect sense, but I realize it's very non-intuitive. So I'm gonna go slow here because maybe before you go on, yeah. go back one slide. Sorry, this is really naive, but do we really have no prior constraint on alpha two? Uh, it's just it could be anything because to me it seems like natural for it to be roughly well, I'm gonna talk about some constraints. Actually, yeah, no, we don't have any first principle or universal constraints on alpha two. Okay. We have a different kind of constraints. Coming from lattice, which is something we're going to talk about next. Okay. Um, okay. So all equations of state have to obey certain thermodynamic properties, and they're usually called stability and causality constraints. Um, the stability constraints come from the fact that the underlying thermodynamic potential for mature equations of state is derived has to have certain properties, and what it means effectively is that you're Pressure should be positive, your entropy density should be positive, your energy density should be positive, as well as barrier number, second order barrier susceptibility. Um, this is a kind of specific heat for heat capacity. I was getting too confused. Heat capacity. Um, and that sound should not travel faster than light in this medium. So these are very general thermodynamical constraints. Uh, so recall that we can write the pressure as a Taylor expansion. And when we introduce this critical behavior from the 3D Ising model, still MUV equals zero, we have to match predictions from lattice. So what we do is we separate the contribution or these coefficients coming from the Ising pressure and this non-Ising component, such that when you add the two together, you get the coefficient from lattice, which we expect to be correct. So this is the true value of susceptibility, and you have a contribution from the 3D Ising critical point that we calculated. So then when you perform the expansion, your reconstructive pressure with the critical point should be this critical pressure you just calculated, plus a Taylor expansion on the non-Ising component to your coefficients. So what that says 
is that if you have a critical contribution that is unreasonable and could not possibly be a granularized results, when you compute this component and you tailor expand and you obtain the full pressure, that pressure might not be compatible with thermodynamic constraints. So you have direct constraints coming from the lattice on what kinds of critical contribution you can have to your equation state. Let me see if I have time to go through all the details. I do not. Okay. I am going to talk about the main points here. There was a machine learning component to the talk, but I think the other stuff is more important. So I'm going to skip the machine learning and then maybe come back if we have time. Um, so this equation of state that we just constructed has a critical point in the fragment of solid class, and it should be matched by this PCD and equals zero. However, that's not a guarantee for every set of parameters. You can build critical regions that are not compatible with lattice prediction. So traditionally, what you would do to check that you built something that's compatible with, with lattice constraints is compute all your thermodynamics across the entire phase diagram, and then check if you've broken anything. And this is, of course, computationally very expensive and ineffective. So we do a machine learning classification of our parameter space. And that allows us to, to map it in its entirety. We use a cool technique called active learning. Uh, My voice kind of needs a break. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my voice wasn't that good. I'm going to lower the volume. Um, okay. So, what it means for us to observe this dip is that you have to run into a region of negative protosis. Um, as you're approaching the critical point from the crossover side. So what that requires in terms of our uh, parameters in the mapping is that you compress the Ising axes to a very small angle, which then projects this critical contribution towards the mu equals zero axis. So it turns out that lattice doesn't like that. And so, so what you have to look for in order to determine if this prediction is um, allowed in this parameterization, is if you can construct combinations of parameters that allow you to have a small difference in these angles. Um, on the other hand, all that's required for you to have a peak is for you to run into the um, positive region in the kurtosis as you're going to from the crossover side. And because this positive lobe um, has a lot of flexibility to bend upwards, essentially there are no constraints along this T direction. It's a lot more easy, it's easier to get no dip in a divergent peak. So our question was, can you get a dip in a divergent peak and still agree with lattice? And after we did this machine learning classification of the equation of state parameter space, basically what we found is that in order to have that kind of behavior, you need to shrink your critical region and make it disappear. So that's what that figure is showing. It's showing you the biggest critical region you can have for a particular value of this angular difference. And you can see that there's a missing regime right where you would expect to see the dip. So what this is telling me is that there is no way with the current model that we can construct this dip and peak behavior in the kurtosis. <laughs> Questions? Because my book is giving. So how, how general is that conclusion? So, can, can you follow from your assumption that you, that you have these two axes that you, that you can check? How general can you avoid that? Can you think about different? There is some model independence here. So the biggest assumption is the form of the mapping. So we assume a linear map. So of course, when you have a small angle, 
all of that critical mm -hmm. contribution is going to be projected towards your VB. So there could be any number of mappings that you can try. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that we're limited by the range of the lattice equation of state because we rely on it to calculate the non ising contribution. So because we only have access to a limited order, that limits our range in UV. So we can go up to about 600 in UV, in UV which is within the beam energy scan program. But some would argue that you can have a critical region that is way above that identical potential. So that's not something we can explore here. Those are the two components. Um, okay, but those are the most strict is that you assume it's linear, which means yes. really goes all the way to the axis. Yes. And if you would cut it off, if you would make it a block, would do what you want, and you would never be constrained by that. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, if you have control over how quickly the critical behavior vanishes, then yeah, you could construct something like that. I really hope my voice makes it through. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about the dynamical side, as dynamical as I can get with these theoretical tools. Um, so in hydraulic collisions, your system, of course, is not probing just a single point in your phase diagram. You start with some energy density, and then you pull. And as you pull, you explore the lower T um, regime of the phase diagram. And this idea of critical lensing is that the trajectory that your system follows along the phase diagram as it's pulling and expanding will be affected by the presence of a critical point. So that is because in ideal hydrodynamics, the trajectory that the system follows, they're called isentropic trajectories. So those are trajectories of constant S over NB. And of course, critical scaling affects those variables. So you would expect to see a change in those lines of constant S over NB. So that's what this figure illustrates. This is the shape you roughly expect to see when no critical point is present, present. And in the presence of a critical point, you will see those trajectories bending towards the critical point because of that critical scaling. Um, so two questions that we asked here. One is, what is the dependence of these this bunching of hydrodynamic trajectories on the size and shape of the critical region? Um, and the second is, we use a very simplified hydrodynamic setup to study the interplay between critical lensing and viscous effects. So the system that we actually create in heavy ion collisions is not going to be in perfect equilibrium. So there could be viscous effects that would smear out any lensing effects that would be coming from the equilibrium portion. Okay. So as far as the bunching of these isentropic trajectories, you can actually calculate this analytically because we define the map um, between the eyes and variables and the PTD variables. And so you can just look at the, the spacing between isentropic trajectories and how they depend on final points again, mu b and t. Um, so this assumes that you're approaching the system from the crossover side. So this is a, an approximation just for us to have a qualitative understanding of the behavior. I'm going to show actual results in a bit. Uh, but what you get is that the spacing goes to zero with powers uh, linearly with R um, as you approach the critical point from the crossover side. This is just confirmation of that lensing is an effect that we expect to see. Okay. You can also calculate the dependence of how this spacing changes on your mapping parameters. So here I kept other parameters fixed and I only changed the scaling parameters that relate to the size and shape of the critical region. And when you look at isentropic trajectories, and then in the background, I'm showing the kurtosis again, you see that if you have a critical region that is much bigger in the temperature direction than it is on the UV direction, you have a stronger lensing effect. So this would be <clears throat> the biggest critical region that you can have in T, and this will be the smallest one that I'm showing, and the more stretched along the UV. And you can see that these trajectories are way further apart from each other. So that 
the intuition for that is that you're when you have a critical scaling that starts at higher t your system sees that scaling for longer uh, so it just follows from the fact that your system is just living in that scaling region um, for a longer time frame during the collision now we also studied algorithm equilibrium effects so this is a very simple can I ask a question? Can you go back one slide, please? So it's uh, so it's existing in the t direction longer, but just visually, uh, how does how this represent? Because on the right, to me, that just, it looks like the one that's I guess less stretched along t, like looks a little bit more bent on its like, or or is it which is the direction it's bending it in? Um, so what you want to look at for the lensing effects is this, yeah. the spacing between these purple lines. Oh, okay. So the spacing is reduced. So these are all corresponding to the same fixed values of S over NB. Mm -hmm. And you can see that they're closer together in this case than that case at the bottom. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the question. It's important clarification. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we had a very uh, simple thermodynamic setup. Um, just um, it's a system that just involves evolves in time, has no spatial dependence. Uh, it's called the Bjorken expansion. Uh, but we included shear and bulk viscosity, and these terms, the evolution of the system was sensitive to the critical point via the equation of state. So we were using the equation of state with the critical contribution that I just introduced, and the scaling of the bulk viscosity. Uh, so what we created essentially was just um, a sweep across the phase diagram at high temperatures by using fixed energy densities, but fluctuations in your initial barium density, um, as well as your um, viscous corrections. And then this is our best attempt to simulate experiment. Okay? What we did is we kept track out of all of those multiple trajectories that we produced in the beginning, which ones passed through a window, um, a few MeV below the critical point. So this was simulated freeze out temperature and then a freeze out window for the width. So we had a seven MeV width and then a couple MeV um, below the critical point. And we collected those trajectories. So this would be uh, like simulating what you're freeze out at a given beam energy to see. Assuming you're very close to the critical point. Oh, sorry, this yes. makes sense. I, I don't understand what a zero plus one through five through simulation is. Can you explain? It just means that it just evolves in time. There's no spatial dependence to the, the charges just propagate. They propagate in time, right? Space. Just in time. Well, they're propagating in space, yeah. but there is no spatial dependence to how the charges are propagating. Oh, okay. So okay. if you have... <laughs> okay. 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 Sorry. Yeah. So you have, if you see something like two plus one, the hydrogen, yeah. you have a plane and you have cells that, you know, there's a spatial dependence to how your yeah. system evolves. Here, it just expands. It's still evolving in space. It's just, there's no spatial yes, yes, dependence. No. Okay. They both okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. So I think a few slides ago you mentioned that like each of these trajectory would be uh like how the system evolves as it cools down from uh like a quark long plasma and then to like going forward in time. So how should I interpret the lines where it starts from a higher mu b and then goes to like like for example the second plot uh, the, the second second row first column like that plot the blue lines are starting from a higher mu b and then goes to, yeah like and then then curves to a critical point and then so that can happen okay. as you can see even in the ideal hybrid trajectories um So are you asking me if that's like forbidden dynamically for some reason or? Because I was thinking at uh, like when you collide two beams and then you start off with a QGP, that QGP essentially uh, like has a UB equals zero. Uh, if we're 
talking about LHC energy and then like oh, no, no, as no. it hadronize it increases yeah. mu b to more yeah. like ordinary matter no so this would be a, so we're not thinking about any specific beam energy for the starting point of these trajectories we just create a lot of different possibilities for how you can start in your phase diagram and then how those trajectories evolve is going to be dependent on the equation state in these viscous corrections that we introduced so this is not one, it's not an ideal trajectory. It has viscous corrections. But two, um, we're probing a lot of different possibilities. And then we're saying that we're keeping track of what you would see experimentally, assuming that your system froze out in this, this window defined here by the two lines. Okay. So, so not... with the viscous corrections, you can have something that starts very far away in the phase diagram from where it would end up. Also kind of right. I, I guess I'm just trying to like think of an example where it would be like this. But you are saying not all of them are realistic or like no, it's not. I think they understand your question. Um so you can start at a very large variant density if you because your system is out of equilibrium, so you would have fluctuations in the variant density within the fireball that you just created. So you can have one cell in your hydro simulation that is very far in phase diagram and density and others that are not so much because you have, you know, your actual collision will probe a range in the phase diagram, just, not just one trajectory. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, so it could be very local. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. The overall- Your hydro could be seeing, you know, that trajectory just as like a very tiny effect that one cell is okay, doing. Okay. One cell as in like, one specified uh, X, Y, Z location. Is that? Yes, if we're talking about, uh, yes. Okay, okay. Um, it depends on what you're keeping track of in your hydro, if it's physical space or if you're doing SEH hydro. But the point is, it could be a local effect or it could be that you're at lower beam energy and you have a hydrodynamical system that is just a high, very high density. Okay. Um, okay, so our attempt here was to understand, assuming you have a freeze out window, what is the density of trajectories and how spread out are they in terms of initial conditions in your phase diagram? And for critical points where you have a large scaling region in the temperature direction, a lot of trajectories end up being attracted to this critical point. So you would you see a larger density of trajectories in these plots. And then if you go to those weaker critical points that I was showing, the lensing effect is not as strong. So naturally you see a lower density of trajectories. So what that means for the kurtosis is that um, so now recall that I have this freeze out window here that it would be what my experiment would see. So then you can look at the kurtosis for that window and look at how many trajectories are hitting inside that window and capture the value of the kurtosis at freeze out for different freeze out temperatures. So we tried one and three MeV. And this is the exact same critical point across columns. And then this row displays a critical point that is smaller in the T direction. Um, so what you see is that you have large fluctuations once you account for out of equilibrium effects in the value of the kurtosis at freeze out um, versus smaller fluctuations when you have a smaller point. So actually the plot that I want to talk about more is this one, which looks at your average kurtosis signal that you would see. Um, the lines are the one sigma from the histograms here on the right. So then here I'm actually showing three different critical points. Um, this one being the stronger one and this one being the weaker one. So this is more stretchy in UB. This one is very large in T and skinnier in UB. And you can see that not only you have a larger value of the kurtosis when you have a stronger lensing effect, um, you also have larger fluctuations. But the average values are very close to the 
ideal case when you don't account for out of reported effects. So then if you recall, I was talking about, and unfortunately I don't have time to talk about the machine learning, but we did a full scan of the parameter space and we looked at the entire range that was allowed by lattice PCD. And the picture that emerged is that there is a preference based on lattice PCD results and our parameterization and all of the assumptions that come with it for critical points that are larger in the T direction. So our results support actually the case where you have very strong lensing um, in, your, in your system. So that's good news if we're thinking about capturing a divergence of the kurtosis. It means it will be enhanced experimentally. Um, I want to end with just a comment about these theoretical comparisons and interpreting beam energy scan results. And that what we actually need to make precise statements is a quantitative description of heavy ion collisions at beam energy scan energies. So that requires you to have a good grasp of the equilibrium quantities. So the equation state, as I just talked about for the last 15 minutes, but also the dynamical scheme. So all those other blobs that I talked about in the beginning. And you should be able to correlate observables, predict the magnitude of expected effects, account for background, and you have to relate discovery at a given beam energy, nuclear species, impact parameter to the phase boundary or the critical point at a specific T. So this task is very challenging. So even if we do achieve from the second round of the beam energy scan, a divergence in the kurtosis to actually make a statement about what that means about the phase diagram that I was showing in the beginning, we're decades away from that. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that by mapping a critical point from the 3D Eisen model to the PCD phase diagram, you can perform a systematic study of critical signatures in the barium kurtosis. And in our current model, a diverging peak is the robust signature um, of a critical point. So the, the strength of this signal in experiments or the signature in experiments is dependent on how strong you have um, your critical lensing is, which is dependent on the shape of your critical region. And this is an effect that was observed both in and out of equilibrium in a very simplified dynamic setup. And the claim that relates that to the shape of the critical region is that when you have something that extends along the T direction, your system sees that for longer in the collision. So you end up with large positive fluctuations in uh, the barrier process. We are currently studying improvements to the hydro setup so that I can get closer. We as a community can get closer to this list here. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, we have some questions during the talk. There are more questions. Yes, up front. The conclusion took me by surprise because the slide that was last, I thought you showed that after you put everything in and the lensing, you arrive back at what would happen if I put any of that block. So, great, you can do it, but does it matter? You seem to, that is, did I misunderstand what you said on this slide? I thought you said that the values come out pretty much the same as if you. Ah, the out of equilibrium effects. Um, they would introduce higher fluctuations. So it does matter for the analysis because you would just have. But didn't my average cut but it averages out, yeah. what I measure is an average come out to be the same? Yes, it averages out to roughly the isentropic reservoirs. But I should say this is a very simplified dynamical setup. So it could be that once we study systems that are more realistic with space spatial dependence, um, that it would be different. But with this very simplified setup, it is true. It just averages out to the ideal value. And so then I guess the other one was like, why am I then decades away from knowing what T and U B that happens? I mean, if I see the nice wiggle, <laughs> I know what square root S. You can if you see an excess, there is nothing. If you see an excess in the kurtosis with respect to the baseline, as far as I'm aware, there's nothing else that explains it other than critical behavior. Um, so you could celebrate, but then the issue is here. You could take the simple explanation, assume that nothing matters, and just do ideal hydro and then map that to, to T and UV. But you have all these different components that I didn't even 
explore in the talk related to the initial conditions a mixture of phases in the system the hadronic phase um i mean the hadronic phase alone is critical fluctuations we don't know how to properly propagate so this this is just what we're seeing from the equation of state so then once you have actual hadrons what happens between those hadrons until they reach the detector? I think what she said is you find you found the bridge point where it gave you at the order for her to interpret how it came to the peak. She's likely way to calculate this. Yeah, that, okay. The theory is, but I think like all these other additions, which I agree, we totally need to be able to model are gonna wash it out more than make something. So experimentally, we know T and UV, it happens at now we have to be able to model it properly. Yeah, and if she predicts a critical point with all this stuff, you don't know whether the peak is there. So if you find it, you found it. If I don't find it, it may still be there. That's yes, right. yes, yes, so yes. That's, that's an important so point. Yes. Very important. And found it, you're there. Okay, good. Thanks. Yes, yeah, there are very many cases, uh, and I didn't focus on those, but where you just wouldn't see the critical point at all. It's small enough and it's mostly right. stretched in the UV direction. You just miss it. Out easily. Yeah. yeah. It's nothing so it could be that we passed it already. Who knows? Um, but yeah, if we see an excess with like small enough error bars, high enough statistical significance, there's nothing else that explains that excess as far as I'm aware. And you also, while I've got the floor, you said uh, the excess with all your calculations to date remains, but the dip. It's could not, go away. It's not I mean, it may not be that. Right? The dip not is not robust. Mean it. And yeah, but also the dip, um, maybe you know this already, you can explain it with different mechanisms, like fully hydronic models, which only take into account like global baryon number conservation and the fact that we don't capture all the, the baryons, they can reproduce that decrease in the baseline. So it could be that the baseline just goes down and that's what we've seen to 3.1 sigma significance. Yeah, it could right. be that the signal goes away. I don't know. My experiment friends like to tell me that. <laughs> and sometimes you have a point and then it changes. <laughs> so it could go away. <laughs> um, and if it does, it again, it doesn't mean that there's no critical point. But I also wouldn't be excited over a dip if we only see a dip. But to me, that's not a critical signal. Yeah, very basic question. I mean, great, great talk. Thanks for coming, by the way. Um, I still, to this day, have a very difficult time understanding what these isotropes mean because. I mean, I can I can picture very easily what entropy per baron number is, but this is entropy per net baron. Yes. So like I, I guess like I in my head I can't really fully understand what is what that means. Like what entropy per baron net baron number is. It's the trajectory that your system follows. It just propagate an ideal hydro. So you can see this if you just have like an ideal dust ball and you have the hydrodynamic description for that you see that it follows trajectories of constant as of energy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about I haven't thought about this stuff in a long time. <laughs> you know I'm not a hydro person. <laughs> uh, but that's my understanding of it is that it's just the ideal hydro propagation. Uh, so as Isaac kind of mentioned before, like kind of asking like if we had an idea of where alpha one or alpha two is like sat, like is that something that could be measured and would that help with like constraining theoretical estimates or? So measured is tricky. Okay. Um, but you can try to calculate it from effective models. So you can come up with some effective description of QCD yeah. and then you can essentially calculate what those parameters would be in your theory. Yeah. And okay. by virtue of that, you can string the mapping. So people have done this um, from like more general arguments or an expansion about a particular regime, try to constrain these um, mapping <laughs> parameters. Is it correct to say you can't calculate in QCD, but you can calculate in the IG model? Mm -hmm. Now, try to map a completely different theory and something which you actually measure. That mapping is. If you don't know what your theory, what QCD looks like, mm. and then it, that's why it's extraordinary. If you know QCD well enough that you know the method, then you can probably calculate that directly. Yes, 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 of course. Yeah. Okay. So you look under the you look under the lamp post, and then somebody has to tell you where the lamp post is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but my point is that people come up with 
effective models for QCD, and we don't know what the correct description is. But if you have a description mm. that you believe to be true for whatever reason, you can calculate the value of those parameters. Mm. And okay. that can inform, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, but, but none of these effective descriptions are, you know, proven to be the correct theory of QCD in that regime. The other constraints come from general, from, from lattice, right? So it's first principle approximation. You mentioned briefly about machine learning techniques. Uh, how much can machine learning techniques help in the calculation? Oh. Or what is this active machine learning? Yeah, so, so for us, it was a question of we have all these unconstrained parameters here. So huge multi dimensional parameter space. And it represents what is allowed by what the most general principles that we can come up with um, in terms of the behavior of your, a critical region of PCB. So it was really important for us to map this parameter space so we know what is the variability that you can get in the behavior of the critical region on the face diagram. And so what we did instead of plugging in different values and sort of mapping it like as a grid, I have an example here. Um, so you can see you can keep other parameters fixed and then go one by one and your other parameters change them, check if it's good or bad with lattice results. And you have an infinite number of combinations because this parameter space is continuous. That's not too efficient. No, no, no. So that's precisely why we use machine learning. And we use a technique called um, active learning, which allows you to train your machine learning model along boundaries where you have a change in quality of behavior. So you're not wasting samples, learning what your equations of state are doing in regimes where clearly your parameters are fine with lattice. You're learning the boundaries. So this is a very efficient way to train a machine learning algorithm. And we achieved very high accuracy uh, with the random forest model, which is very simple, easy to train model uh, with just a few thousand samples out of this massive parameter space. And then once we have this model trained, so this desired accuracy, we just have the entire parameter space mapped out. So now we, I just have one line of code where I ask, is this good? And then my model tells me yes or no instead of having to go through the entire calculation again, of taking the derivatives, checking that all of the thermodynamic constraints are respected. So we have a whole separate paper just in the machine learning part. Um, and then of course the other consequences that you can look at the probability distributions for where your parameters are allowed to be and then infer general trends. So this is what I ended on is that the general trend is a preference for a stronger lensing effect. That could be also could be the other fact of your linear approximation. Sorry? Could that be an artifact or, or a consequence of your linear approximation? Because constraints come yes. together. Yeah, yeah. So this could just be a saying that, hey, if you want to have a critical point um, and you want it to be big, it has to point up, not horizontally. So there are, the Houston group is working right now on a quadratic map. So we plan to redo the analysis once we have the quadratic map. They're also working with a new lattice expansion scheme, which allows you to go to slightly higher chemical potentials, around 750. Um, and we're very interested to see what happens when we do the analysis there, because it could be that those small angles are now allowed. They would still be a minority in terms of all the allowed parameter space, but they're no longer ruled out. Here, they're ruled out. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see more questions. So if you have any others, you can feel free to talk to Deborah throughout the rest of the day. Um, thank you a lot of time.